Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Today, we're going to look at the two Annunciation passages in the Gospel of Luke. What's the first Annunciation? Zechariah. The second Annunciation is to Mary. Although both of these passages are usually read in Advent, I'd like for us to look at them again today, but this time in the light of Christmas. In both Annunciations, the same angel, Gabriel, comes bearing extraordinary news that is biologically impossible. I love the way Anna Carter Florence puts it. For Zechariah, the word is that his elderly wife, as old as any of the golden girls, in direct violation of the laws of infertility and menopause, is about to become pregnant. And for Mary, the word is that she, in direct violation of the laws of Moses and high school health, is also about to become pregnant with the Messiah, the Son of God. Biblical angels are certainly interesting creatures. Gabriel, whose name in Hebrew means, God is my warrior, is one of only two named angels in the Old Testament, the other being Michael. In the book of Daniel, Gabriel is sent to explain a vision of the time appointed for the end, and later to reveal the hidden meaning of prophetic words. In Luke's gospel, Gabriel first appears to Zechariah. Both Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth are from priestly families, and we're told both are righteous and blameless before God. Unfortunately, their greatest disappointment was not being able to conceive a child. Like Abraham and Sarah, their Old Testament counterparts, they have waited and waited and waited, longing for a gift from God that simply would not come. And then one day, Zechariah is going about his regular duties as a priest in the temple, and suddenly there is Gabriel standing in front of him next to the altar. The text says Zechariah was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. And the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Later on, Mary encounters the same angel. Once again, Gabriel appears on the scene with big news, coupled with those familiar angelic words of comfort. Do not be afraid. The big news here is that young Mary, a virgin, will conceive a son, and his name will be called Jesus. Frederick Beekner, in his book, Peculiar Treasures, captures the instant just before her response beautifully in his description of the encounter between Mary and Gabriel. He writes, she, she, struck the she struck the angel Gabriel as hardly old enough to have a child at all, let alone this child. But he'd been entrusted with a message to give her, and he gave it. He told her what the child was to be named and who he was to be, and something about the mystery that was to come upon her. You mustn't be afraid, Mary, he said. As he said it, he only hoped she wouldn't notice that beneath the great golden wings, he himself was trembling with fear to think that the whole future of creation hung now on the answer of a girl. The illustration that accompanies this entry in Beekner's book shows Gabriel, 
crossing his fingers behind those great golden wings because an awful lot hinged on her answer. But Mary bravely said yes to this remarkable challenge, and the rest, as they say, is history. By the way, for any youth who are hearing this, remember that Mary was much closer to your age than to mine. So don't ever let anyone tell you that you're too young to do amazing things for God. Now, in comparing the two Annunciation stories in Luke's gospel, Mary comes across as much more courageous and powerful than Zechariah. Notice that in both Annunciations, the same angel, Gabriel, comes bearing extraordinary news that is biologically impossible. Zechariah and Mary are not sure what to make of these moments of truth. And so each one asks the angel a different question. Zechariah, who at the time was alone offering incense in the temple, asks, how will I know this? At that point, Gabriel zaps him with a mute curse that lasts until his son is born. On the surface, this seems a bit odd. Why would the angel be offended when Zechariah is only asking for a sign to prove the angel's words. Zechariah is apparently punished for questioning the angel's promise that God had heard their desperate prayer and Elizabeth, Elizabeth was going to bear a son. If you'd hope for something, not just for months or years, but for decades, and not seen it materialize, isn't it understandable when, that when news like this finally came, you might be a little bit skeptical? And keep in mind, what was standing in front of Zechariah in that moment was not his wife in her sixth or eighth month of pregnancy, but an angel delivering words of promise. But let's take a deeper look. It seems to me that Zechariah is mostly concerned with having proof of this promise that he can then share with the people when he comes out of the sanctuary. In other words, he's been given an unbelievable and utterly amazing piece of news. News that will bring Zechariah lots of questions and probably plenty of ridicule. And he's looking for some cover to protect himself which shows that his question is more about him than about God. His question reveals how preoccupied he may be with his power and his reputation. His question is also a little funny when we consider what Zechariah did for a living. I mean, as a priest who prays every day to the God of Abraham and Sarah, is there any biblical precedent that Zechariah might have remembered when hearing the news that God will give a child to their couple in their old age? Perhaps Genesis 17, that little bit about Sarah, the pregnant golden girl. Now, Mary's question to the angel is entirely different. She doesn't ask, how will I know this? No, her question is, how can this be? Notice, it's not a question about her. It's a question about the event. It's a question about the one who's going to do this impossible act. Again, I love how Anna Carter Florence puts it. And the angel is classically gagged at Mary's directness, that he's almost embarrassed and can't answer without euphemism. Oh, well, how? Uh, how? Let's see, how? The Holy Spirit will overwhelm you. 
And Mary seems to expect that there is no way to explain this. Beyond words, God breaks in and the word becomes flesh. She agrees. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Now for a girl who is about to be as unprotected as it gets in a society that, that requires stoning in her case, this is astonishing. Who's going to need more proof than Mary? I mean, Joseph's going to know this child's not his. Zechariah's annunciation merely threatens his good name and his job as priest. Mary's threatens her life. Now, I have to admit that I'm more often like Zechariah than like Mary. I mean, I often find that it's not easy to be a person of faith today in a place like Seattle. And it would be nice to have a little bit more cover. Now, I do believe that Christian faith is based on a solid foundation, that there is sufficient evidence on which to build our faith. And as Bob Munger liked to say, enough to put our trust in God's trustworthiness. But still, I often wish for more. I admit that it would really be helpful if God would provide us with more concrete evidence of his presence, more evidence on which we could rest our faith, more evidence that we could share with the skeptical world. Unfortunately, that's not the primary way God has chosen to operate. Tom Long makes the case that God is not present in the world as evidence. God is present in the world as promise, as the one who makes promises. God does not primarily say, look here, do you see that? There's some concrete evidence that I am at work in the world. He says instead a much harder word. Despite the evidence around you, despite what your eyes see, there is coming a day when I will beat swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. I promise you. Over against all the evidence that evil is winning, there is coming a day when those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled and the meek will inherit the earth, I promise you. Contrary to the evidence you see, the Jesus whom you saw suffer and die on the cross will live again on the third day, I promise you. The thing about promises is that the actual evidence of their truthfulness only comes in hindsight. We can't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that a promise is true ahead of time. That is, we don't have evidence for it in the form of cold, hard facts until we actually watch it come true sometime later on, which is why faith is required. I've shared this story before. Um, Tom Long was my preaching professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. And years ago, when Tom first moved to Princeton, New Jersey, he started worshiping at a Presbyterian church that was right by the campus of Princeton University. It's much like UPC is right near the campus of University of Washington. And the congregation there had a rich intellectual life. There were a lot of university and seminary professors in the congregation. So it seemed like a natural place for him to go and worship. One Wednesday night, he was at a family night supper, and he found himself seated next to a man he did not know, and they struck up a conversation. The man said to him, 
Sir, I don't, I don't recognize you. I've never met you before. Uh, how long have you been at this church? Have you been a member long? And Tom said, oh, no, no, not long. We've, we've just moved into town and, and just joined the church. How about you? How long have you been at this church? Oh, my goodness. I've been at this church my whole life. In fact, I think I may be the last non-intellectual left in this congregation. Tom said, you're kidding. He said, smiling, no, no, I'm not. Then he joked, I, I don't think I've understood a sermon that's been preached here in 25 years. But then he said, you know, I'd never leave this church. He went on to say that every Monday night, he and a few others from that congregation took the church van up to the youth correctional facility in Somerville, New Jersey. He says, sometimes we have a Bible study. Sometimes we just play ping pong and try to get to know the guys, trying to bring some comfort and hope into a bleak situation. I started doing that because I thought it was the sort of thing a Christian ought to do. But now I would not miss a Monday night because I have found that God has already gone there before me and it nourishes my soul just as God promised. And then he said this, you know, I have found that you cannot prove any of the promises of God in advance. But if you live them, they're true, every one. That's the advantage of seeing these Advent texts in the light of Christmas. We know that both Zechariah and Mary lived these promises, and they both discovered they were true, every one. Neither Zechariah's doubts nor Mary's very legitimate fears in any way impeded God's fulfillment of his promises. That's why when we look at life through the lens of God's promises fulfilled in Christmas and Easter, we can have true hope, even in the midst of life's many hardships and challenges. Hope comes from a faithful God who keeps his promises. Jim Wallace said, hope is believing in God's promises in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. Now, hope is not the same thing as optimism. Some of you may remember uh, James Stockdale. In fact, uh, our former executive presbyter of Seattle Presbytery, Boyd Stockdale, was related to James Stockdale. James Stockdale was a commander and pilot in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War. He was captured and he was a prisoner of war for seven years. And during that time, he was regularly kept in solitary confinement, tortured, and beaten. Later, he talked about the difference between him and some of the other American captives who experienced the same cruelty at the hands of the North Vietnamese guards. Uh, and these, these captives actually died in the prison camp. Those prisoners, he said, were optimists. They tried to look on the bright side of life, and they would say things like, Christmas, we'll be out by Christmas. And when it wasn't so, they said, well, Easter, we'll be out by then. They eventually died of a broken heart. 
What Stockdale is pointing to is the difference between hope and optimism. Optimism looks at the facts and chooses to put a positive spin on them. Christian hope recognizes how bad things really are, but knows that God is bigger. But Stockdale said another thing that goes even further. He says, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. That's the crucial dimension of hope, that this experience I'm going through, far from something I seek to suppress or erase or delete or forget, will come to be the defining experience of my life, which when, when I look back, I would not have any other way. As Sam Wells notes, this is Christmas hope. We'll never be ready, and some of us are in a real mess. But here's the good news. Christ has come anyway. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christmas hope. We thank you that your promises come true, every single one. Be with us now and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.